Hey guys, welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through observation of the cervical spine. We're going to be breaking down your observation into an anterior, lateral and posterior view, and we're going to be highlighting key traits and common pathologies in each view. So when you're observing your patient's cervical spine posture, there are a couple of key things to bear in mind. Number one is an asymmetry between the right and left sides. And number two is a deviation from the midline. It may be that one of these two things is creating unequal pressures between your patient's right and left sides. And it may be that normalizing this pressure is the best way that you can help them. Compare your patient's cervical spine posture to that of a typically normal cervical spine posture. Furthermore, you may see in our other observational videos that we go into a lot more detail about inflammatory signs, redness, swelling and bruising, as well as bony deformity. We don't go through this as much in this video as it's less common to see this presentation with cervical spine pathology. Needless to say, however, if you see any of this within your patient, you need to act upon it. So, with that in mind, it's time to get into our main video. Let's get clinical. So we're going to start our observation of the cervical spine in an anterior view. And we're going to look firstly at the relative scapula or shoulder blade position. Your patient may present with any range of scapular positions, such as it might be elevated, depressed, protracted, retracted, upwardly tilted or downwardly tilted. The two most common presentations are number one, depressed and protracted, and number two, to elevated. So we're going to look at both of those and in first we're going to look at depressed and protracted. So that would be if the patient's shoulder is in a neutral position a depressed scapula would be going downwards and a protracted shoulder would be where their scapula is more forward than the neutral. And in this position we find that there is more stress placed on some of the muscles around one side of the cervical spine, particularly levator scapulae and the upper trapezius muscles. These two muscles are stabilizing muscles and they like to function in a position where they're shortened, i.e. when the patient is in a neutral position so they're not stretched. So you can see with this protracted and depressed position that these muscles now are stretched. And that means that when they contract, the sarcomeres of the muscle are further away from each other, which means it's harder for them to contract. As a result of this, the increased stretch means that they have to work from this harder position, which can be causing their pain. So we might like to, during our treatment, try and address that by bringing them in a more upward position. The other thing you might see from this protracted and depressed position is tightness of the pectoralis minor muscle, pec minor. In fact, you can measure this muscle's length by placing the, position, the patient in a supine position and measuring the distance from the height of the bed to their acromion, and you can measure it between the right and the left sides. So that's the protracted and depressed position. The other thing you might notice is that the patient is in a too elevated position of their scapula. And that means that there might be a diff if there's a difference between the right and the left, that might mean that the neck extensor muscles, such as splenus capitis, might be working too hard because they're tight and overactive. And that might be causing the patient's problem as well. So going on from there, the next thing we're going to have a look at is the midline of the neck in the anterior view. And you might be able to look at the ear levels between the right and left, making sure that they're neutral. What you might sometimes see is that the patient's cervical spine is in more of a side flex position, like so. With our model Andy here, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but we're using this to show you the problem. So they might be in an increased side flex position for three reasons. Number one, it might be that their pain is caused by the compression on the side that is side flexed. So for example, in this right side flex position, there is more pressure being put on the right, -sided, uh, the right side of the cervical spine joints. It might be the facet joint. It might be that if you have a patient who presents with osteoarthritis, you can suggest that the rate of arthritis is progressed on the right side because of that inc increased compression, and that might be the reason for their pain. The second thing to consider is if they have positioned themselves more side flexed in order to adapt to their pain on the other side. It might be that in order to open up or offload the left side, your patient may be more side flexed towards the right. 
So that's the second one, an, adapted posi an adapted position. The third reason that this might have occurred is because of a maladaptation. And that might be where the patient originally adapted, like we said in the second scenario, but then they have been unable to correct this. So they've they, uh, they brought themselves into this position to offload the left side, but over time that means that you're stretching the left side too much. And because they haven't been able to um, bring this back to normal, they might be experiencing their pain on the left side. And that completes our observation in the anterior view. So now we're going to continue our observation of the cervical spine in a lateral view. And there are three main structures we're going to be considering. Number one is the cervical spine, number two is the thoracic spine, and number three is the shoulder or scapula. The most common presentation that we see in this view if your patient is in pain is what we like to call pokey chin posture. And this is as follows, where the cervical spine is in more of a protracted position, where the thoracic spine is in more of a kyphosed position, and where the shoulder or the scapula is also in a more protracted position. Another indication that your patient has been in a pokey chin posture over a long period of time is an increased bony prominence around C7 or T1, which is known as dowager sign. Dowager sign occurs as a result of the increase in flexion in the lower cervical spine relative to the stiffness or lack of mobility in the thoracic spine. So if we look at the upper cervical spine with pokey chin posture, we can see that there's an increase in extension in these regions. This might put more pressure on the facet joints, for example, whereas in the lower cervical spine, we can see that the patient is in increased flexion. This may put more pressure on the discs of C6 or C7. It may also put more pressure on soft tissue structures as well. As a result of the pokey chin posture, we can see that there's also a change in the patient's rotation dynamics. In this particular position of pokey chin posture, if we ask our model to rotate their neck, we can see that the majority of the rotation occurs in the upper cervical spine. Whereas if we bring him into more of an upward extended position and ask him to rotate again, we can see that there's much more movement throughout the cervical spine. And therefore, as a result, the excess rotation in the upper cervical spine with the pokey chin posture may also be creating their pain. So, as we said with the pokey chin posture, muscles such as the neck extensors, for example, splenus capitis, or muscles such as upper trapezius or levator scapulae can become overactive with this condition. And therefore, we may see pain in the regions that those muscles are located. We also said that muscles such as the lower traps muscles become weak, and therefore we may have pain in that area. It's also important to remember that other structures, such as the shoulder, are affected by the pokey chin posture. For example, the shoulder movement dynamics will be affected by the fact that the scapula is too protracted, and this might be causing the patient a problem with their shoulder movement. Finally, it's important to say that we've talked about uh, how pains can irritate local structures. However, it might be that because of the local structure irritation, your patient's pain may be manifested with referred symptoms in different areas, for example, down to the upper limb in the hand. So now we're going to complete our observation of the cervical spine with our patient in a posterior view. And this particular view, we're looking at similar principles as we did in an anterior view. So we're going to start by looking at the shoulder or scapular position. The main thing that we can see of our patient's scapula in a posterior view compared to an anterior view is whether the scapula is upwardly or downwardly rotated. An upwardly rotated scapula would look like so, where the inferior angle of the scapula comes more lateral, whereas a downwardly rotated scapula would look like this, where the inferior angle of the scapula is going more medially. And the main thing about a downwardly rotated scapula is that it puts a, a stretch on the levator scapulae muscles or on the upper trapezius muscles. And we talked why in an anterior view this would be a problem and might create the patient's pain. So that's in terms of the scapula. 
We're also going to be looking at the relative ear levels between the right and the left sides. We talked in the anterior view about whilst we do this and what problems may arise if your patient presents with a deviation from the midline. And finally, we're going to be looking at the actual positioning of the spine itself, i.e., does it run straight from the cervical spine going down to the thoracic spine? Times in which this may not be the case would be, for example, if the patient has a thoracic scoliosis, where the spine in the thoracic region comes in a more curved position, either concave or convex to the right or left sides. So why does this matter? In terms of the cervical spine, a difference uh, in a, or a scoliosis would indicate that there's a difference in the muscle length between the right and the left sides. And if there is a difference in muscle length, then this is going to put more pressure on either one side or the other of the cervical spine, depending on where your scoliosis is. So to summarize this video on cervical spine observation, observe the patient in an anterior, lateral and posterior view considering two main factors. Number one, an asymmetry between the right and left sides. And number two, a deviation of the spine from a neutral position. Look for some of the key common postural features that we have highlighted in this video, including a difference in scapular position between the right and left sides, a difference in ear levels between the right and left sides, the presence of pokey chin posture, or the presence of a thoracic scoliosis. And that completes our video on observation of the cervical spine. Next, I'd like to suggest you have a look at our other videos within the cervical spine assessment catalogue, particularly active range of movement, so that you can see how the observations we've just highlighted affects your patient's movement. Thank you as always for watching, and we'll see you again soon here on Clinical Physio.